I love the ocean. Like many of you, whether walking beside it, diving under it or sailing across it, I just can't get enough of it. And earlier this year, I was fortunate uh, enough in sailing to remote Pearson Island in the Great Australian Bight. This island, 64 kilometres offshore from the mainland, is a really special place. It's been isolated for over 10,000 years and remained completely free of any introduced pests. And uh, during that relatively short time span, geologically speaking, uh, it's even evolved its own species of rock wallaby, the Pearson Island rock wallaby. Fantastic wildlife, and when we went ashore, we were greeted by these charming sea lions and wallabies. But we were also greeted by this plastic waste. So human waste in the form of plastic has made it to this relatively remote and pristine environment. Now, if plastic like this container stayed ashore, it would merely be ugly. Um, maybe we could live with that, but unfortunately, Plastic from around the world has made its way into, into our oceans. And it's created a, a horrible mess. <laughs> In the North Pacific, and now also South Pacific, there are entire floating islands of plastics caught up in gyres, giant ring-like ocean currents rotating clockwise in the Northern Hemisphere and anti-clockwise in the Southern Hemisphere. And a, re a recent World Economic Forum report warns that the total volume of plastic in our oceans by 2050 will exceed the weight of all of the sea creatures in the ocean. But there's a lot of plastic and the problem is getting worse. Um, why do we know plastics are spreading? Well, through efforts such as Adventure Scientists Global Microplastics Initiative, that's quite a mouthful. <laughs> adventure science, like the name suggests, combines adventure with science. So when I heard about this adventure science from a fellow sailor, I was hooked. I became part of a global group of adventurers uh, tasked with going out around the world and collecting water samples, and that's me collecting water sample as we're sailing. My patch was about 325 kilometers east to west, about 200 kilometers north to south, 65,000 65, square kilometers of water. And I collected uh, only six samples because they all had to be sent to the US, and it's quite heavy uh, sending water overseas, as it turns out. But two of my six samples had microplastics in them, and one of the samples was more than 50 kilometers offshore. I mean, I was gobsmacked. Here you are in the middle of nowhere, and there's microplastics in just a random scoop of water. We, we now know that microplastics um, form in one of two ways. There are primary microplastics that um, are purposely manufactured to be microscopic, and they're everywhere in our modern society. They're, they're used in co cosmetics. They're, they're used in uh, air blasting technology. They're even in the fibers of the clothes we wear. Um, but there are also these so-called secondary mic microplastics, which are resulting from the breakdown of larger plastic debris. The Global Microplastics Initiative collected almost 2,700 samples around the world. 72% of those contain microplastics, uh, of which 90% were fibrous and look like this. So these are very, very tiny particles you need a microscope to see. Zooming out to remote Henderson Island in the North Pacific, sorry, South Pacific. <laughs> um, Henderson Island is one of the Pitcairn Islands. Uh, immortalized by mutiny on the bounty. Today, sadly, Henderson Island is immortalized by plastic. More plastic arrive on this island than anywhere else on the planet. Over 3,600 pieces of plastic litter arrive every single day. And it's not just destroying a beautiful marine environment, it's, it's hurting our wildlife as well. Seabirds are like the canaries in the coal mine when it comes to telling us about the health of our marine environment. 
and things are not pretty. This is Lord Howe Island, and this is a, a dead shearwater bird. Now, I warn you, the next slide is really quite horrible, so you may wish to cover your eyes. Um, um, Dr. Jennifer Lavers from the University of Tasmania is dissecting the gut, and it's very ugly. I'll be quick, but basically, this bird had eaten so much microplastic, it uh, unfortunately killed it. Um, but all kinds of microplastics are finding their way into our ecosystem. So here's a poor turtle with a plastic uh, straw stuck up its nostril. <laughs> Imagine how painful that was removing it. Um, as a society, we're addicted to plastic. We just use it everywhere. Uh, and, and most of it is actually quite unnecessary. I mean, I brought a little bit of show and tell. This has to be possibly the silliest example of plastic I have seen in recent years. Single-use plastic. I picked this up out of a, uh, a rubbish bin in Sydney, just outside the Sydney Convention Centre. It was overflowing with these. Apparently, these antennas, I think that's what they are, were given away to attendees of a Sydney convention. Most attendees bin them as soon as they left the convention centre. And, uh, yeah, these bins were literally metres away from Sydney Harbour. So... We're just producing ridiculous amounts of plastic, 300 million tonnes a year, and we're recycling very little of it, about 10%. <clears throat> so what are we to do about these mountains of plastic and oceans of plastic? Well, for starters, we have to dramatically cut back. The developing world often gets a, a bad rap for not acting quickly enough, but Bangladesh, one of the poorest countries in the world, put in place a total ban on plastics way back in 2002. They did this because plastics had found their way into every part of their country, into waterways, into sewers, and caused catastrophic flooding in 1988 and 1998. It's still a problem in that country, but um, they had the foresight to ban plastics. Over in Europe, Denmark was the first country to, uh, to introduce a tax on retailers selling plastic bags. And Denmark now has the lowest per capita usage of plastic bags in the world. The average Dane only uses four bags a year. Four plastic bags a year, I mean, that's incredible. Um, compared with um, several other European countries which uh, basically have usage rates about 100 times that by comparison. Here, closer to home, uh, here in South Australia, uh, in 2008, we introduced um, a ban on lightweight, checkout-style plastic bags, which has obviously made quite a bit of difference. So there are good examples of um, countries around the world um, doing, doing the right thing. And we're starting to see some positive results as a result of that. I'll share this one, because it's quite, um, quite uh, stark to see the difference. We'll zoom across to Mumbai in India. Um, this is Versova Beach. Until a few years ago, Versova Beach was littered with over 5 million kilograms of rubbish and plastic debris. The entire beach for kilometres looked like that. But with uh, several hundred volunteers over several years, largely due to the leadership of one person, Afroz Shah, it was cleaned up and now, wow, what a difference it can make, yeah. So, we can make a difference. We can clean up our environment if we put our minds to it. These, um, these efforts, though, um, to date, either rely on rallying lots of local volunteers or lobbying politicians or perhaps a bit of both. But there is another way, and that's through the power of global communities and moonshot thinking. By moonshot, I mean huge problems, albeit relatively well-defined problems, but the kinds of problems that require you know, radical new approaches. Uh, and, and not just something that you can kind of tweak and tinker at, uh, but something that requires that you know, take a radically new approach to it, perhaps some new technology. A big part of moonshot thinking is lighting a fire in other people and helping others see that perhaps the impossible might just be possible. Now, with plastics, we have two huge problems that lend themselves to moonshot-like approaches. The first problem is we're simply using 
too much of the stuff, in particular too much single-use plastic, and it's great that this venue um, it has committed to minimise the impact of single-use plastics. Um, it turns out we can all help, though. <clears throat> we can all make a difference. So here's a crazy idea. Just refuse to use it. I mean, don't accept that plastic drinking straw. Ask for a paper straw instead. And, you know, use bamboo toothbrushes and, and take your shopping bag, of course, to the supermarkets. I mean, you know, if we're all mindfully thinking about it, we can make a difference. So that's the first moonshot. The second moonshot is that we need to dramatically improve our scientific understanding of the problem. And it turns out everyone can help with that problem too. Now, earlier I touched on adventure science, but you don't need to be an adventurer. I mean, anyone can be a scientist. Anyone can be a citizen scientist. Science needs data. And the future of low-cost data collection in many, many scientific disciplines, and in particular the life sciences, is putting low-cost technology into the hands of everyday people. So, Technology like this, this is just a smartphone. But with a smartphone, anyone can be a citizen scientist, anyone can contribute to global scientific knowledge. Now, earlier I talked about the Global Microplastics Initiative. That was uh, several hundred volunteers. Uh, we collected almost 2,700 samples. Believe it or not, that was the largest ever data set amassed to date on microplastics. That was the biggest and the bestest. But honestly, and it was an awesome initiative, it really was, but it was still a drop in the proverbial ocean. I mean, our oceans are so vast, we literally just skim the surface. Now imagine this. Imagine if a million people were out there collecting water samples. That would be a game changer. Now imagine if Instead of having to send uh, these uh, liters water bottles to labs, uh, you could actually do that analysis in the field. Well, it turns out the technology to do that is almost here. This is a great example. This is a clip-on microscope. If I can find my smartphone. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's really simple to use. <clears throat> You basically just attach it to the back of your smartphone, and voila, I've now got a 60x microscope. This is a prototype from Adelaide startup Phone Labs, and they're working on a higher res version. Devices like this mean that we can do citizen science on a scale simply not possible to now, especially when we combine it with smart software. That's the clip-on microscope in use at the beach. So smart software such as the RedMap app, RedMap stands for Range Extension Database and Mapping. With, with this app, uh, citizen scientists can contribute their knowledge of Australia's vast coastline. Everyday people, boaters, divers, kayakers, beachgoers, can report their sightings of marine species. This is enabling the creation of a crowdsourced map which is showing how species are moving uh, in response to changes in the marine environment. So, only with this kind of data can we solve that giant moonshot problem of trying to cleanse our oceans of plastic. Now, we don't yet have all the pieces. I've just shared a few of the... Uh, uh, a few of the components, the pieces available today. For example, we still need human expertise to do the analysis in, in the lab, as I was referring to. But in the not too distant future, smart software, artificial intelligence, machine learning techniques will mean that we can actually do these types of things again on the types of devices we carry around with us every day, our phones. <clears throat> in the end, it will be everyday people caring for our environment, refusing one straw at a time and engaged in citizen science that make this straw the last straw. Thank you.